and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. You got Luke. Luke, today we're going to tear apart a great topic. Oh my goodness, I oh, see what you did there. We're looking at Velcro. So, first of all, I don't know how we haven't done this before. Like I do. If <laughs> are you already hating on this one? No, on. no, keep listening. Yeah, everyone. keep listening, everybody, because <laughs> it's really good. James didn't do crack research like I did. I guess not. Uh, I mean, it has to be like now that I've done the research, how is this not like one of the in like our top invention episodes? Like we'll probably redo top inventions at some point and just just like to a, have this as number one. No, just to have a second take on it, you know, fresh set of eyes and ears and that oh, sort of really thing. Oh, we really could. Yeah. And that one does always get a lot of hate mail for what yeah, we left and, off. And so. the opinion will change over time and stuff like that. But I think Velcro for me would definitely get added to the top of my, maybe not top 10, maybe top 20. Okay. So, well, yeah. that's fair. But in in everyone else's defense, you aren't really able to tie your own shoes because you never learned that skill. So Velcro is really important to your exactly. day-to-day life. Exactly. <laughs> so Velcro okay, let's get into this. or velour crochet, the French words for velvet and hooks, as it might be called for those right? in our French community, um, was actually completely discovered by accident, right? So we got to go all the way back to 1941, and there was a walk in the woods, James. See, I saw 41 and I saw 48, which makes me question people's research. I went with 1941 as well because I think that's officially on their website. It all, yeah, it came off of because Vel- Velcro yeah. is very much like Google, right? It's the it's name of the not company. Not at all, but no, yes, but, but, in like, this the respect way, it is. Like, the name of the company. <laughs> is Velcro and their product is also it like Velcro's See, become, I said, even I said like isn't Velcro, it's called Velcro. Kleenex. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Like so with their company, which I didn't exactly. know before this. Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Um, so this guy by the name of George de Mastel, he was a Swiss electrical engineer, not bad as engineers go, but chemicals are better, but uh, of course, at least he's not a civil, um, <laughs> was actually, <laughs> we're going to get hate for that one. I as know usual. all the time, uh, was taking a stroll through the woods with his beloved dog. And at the end of the Sparky. walk, Sparky, I think was the dog's name. Uh, we've all experienced this, James. We're walking and you get back and all of a sudden your pants are covered and your dog are covered with cockleberries. Cockleberries. Cockle, cockleburs. 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 And if you don't know what they are, if you've ever walked in the woods, they're those little round balls that have the little pointy things on them that take forever to come out of your dog. And I imagine your dogs back in the day, like, oh my gosh. because they're long hair, it was yeah. probably impossible to get out of your dog. It, it was a haircut for sure. Yeah. Uh, there were many times because I had those big trees back behind my old oh, house. Right, We'd go them. roaming through there. And yeah, I would have to sit there and like cut their hair out because it was impossible to get out. So they're about yay big. And if you're not watching, which nobody does, go to our no, YouTube channel. No. Uh, so they're about a quarter inch in diameter and they're a little spiky and they hook onto your clothes and hair and stuff like that. And, and George is like, wow, this is like pretty amazing. Pulls out his microscope, looks at these things. And what he discovered was there were these hooks at the end of all of these spires that were coming off of um, these burrs, these cockle burrs. And he basically went on like a 10 year research and development, you know, kind of effort to try to mimic this as a way to secure things. And ultimately he did, and we'll get into all those details, but a walk in the woods is what started it all, James. So first off, the word cockleburr is a whole lot of fun, and I like that. But who shows up after their walk in the woods with their dog all gnarled up with these things, with them all over your pant legs and probably your arms? And then, you know, like you do the like, where where did these ones come from? Mm, and then you start all, yeah. getting those and you they're spread everywhere. them across. Who is like, you know what this would be is a great use in real life as opposed to just being frustrated and grumpy about having these things stuck all over you especially like a mechanic electrical engineer like i could see if you were like into like the the fabric world or something like that or maybe you were a seamstress or something but the fact that yeah so so george this cat was born uh june 19th uh 1907 in culebrer 
Switzerland. Uh, he didn't good today. He didn't go very far. He died on February eighth, nineteen ninety, um, and Kogaman, Switzerland. Uh, and his education was at the Federal Swiss Institute of Technology, La Sa Le Sune, L A U S A N N E. I don't know how you say it. Nailed but. it. Yeah. You know what was interesting about this cat is mm. that. George is one of those people. He actually got his first patent, fun fact, at the age of 12 for a yeah. toy airplane. What is up with like, that? Yeah, right? You know Who what I was doing that? when I was 12? I was still in a Velcro diaper. So <laughs> I, was, I, was, yeah. I was literally using zips because I don't know how to tie my shoes at 12 still. <laughs> Remember zips? Did you have zips? I, I do know zips, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, that's funny. All oh, righty. So, uh, so let's do a little bit of like the history and timeline. Does that work for you? Uh, that sounds perfect to me. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I mentioned 1941 is when he takes this walk, he does a boatload of research uh, for about 10 years. And what he ultimately comes up with is he uses nylon to devise this hook and loop system. So whether you realize it or not, Velcro is actually two separate pieces. One is the loop. We'll talk about Hopefully the details. You know that. <laughs> Maybe you don't. There's also hook and hook systems, which is relatively new. So don't don't count that okay, out. Okay, okay. Um, Stop but poo-pooing. basically, it's a loop and then a whole bunch of hooks on the other side. And the problem was the loops were easy. You just kind of stitch the loops. But like getting those hooks cut just at the right angle so then you smash them into the, uh, the loops to attach and actually work was the difficult part. Uh, yeah, so and you, they had to be like really flexible, yeah. but you also had to be able to still pull them apart without mm-hmm. causing like, you know, catastrophic damage. To well, you them, don't right? you don't want to hurt all the loops because yeah, then did, you'd have this Velcro that doesn't stick. Did you see when he was going through this process, he was actually like touring fabric manufacturers across Europe. Like I think he went to six different fabric manufacturing companies and they were all like, first off, you can't do this. Second off, who wants this garbage? Well, so apparently they all thought it was garbage and we'll get did. to the history up until it went to space. Go figure. <laughs> um, so he does. So he does about a decade of R&D. He actually starts uh, the Velcro company, which I didn't know is an actual company. No. Uh, in about 1952. Um, and he had some additional patents um, that he obtained. But his very original patent was uh, in 1951. And it was in Switzerland, and then he did a U.S. patent in 1955 because he knew the he only was ones that be, matter. He was going to be coming over to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he ultimately did patents in Germany, Great Britain, Sweden, Italy, Holland, Belgium, France, and finally uh, Canada. And I imagine he probably has them all over the place. Um, <clears throat> so he the, had to take out a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan for all of this right yeah am i skipping ahead no 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 you know you're good you're good i just i'm just always impressed when somebody it's kind of like startups today like when somebody has that much faith in themselves and the idea that they've come up with that they're like banking everything they have on it good for them or like imagine asking your buddy like hey james i got this idea i need 150k to start this podcast (laughs) And then you just like walk away with, and I just run away with your money. I would invest in your taco truck. But anyways, okay, go ahead. thank you. Uh, so it takes all the way until 1957. And for some reason, they chose Manchester, New Hampshire to be uh, the, the headquarters in the United States. Uh, but that's the first time it came to uh, the United States. And uh, again, not sure why they chose Manchester. My guess is there's some textiles up there, something like that. I think Maybe. is what I heard. Um, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. And then, so here's the thing. So he's running all over the place, trying to get people to understand like how they could use Velcro for like shoes and fabric and like all these other things. And it was all kind of falling flat. It was it was going okay. Was. And then their big break was. And this is also one of my fun facts. People used to think that NASA developed Velcro for like holding tools and stuff like that in space, like on the walls. It wasn't. It was actually, they reached out to uh, the folks at Velcro Velcro to say, hey, we need to like hold tools and do some things here. Uh, Can you help us out? And they actually, I guess, made Velcro for them for like their suits and their tools and their pants and their sleeping pods and all this stuff. But that was the coolest thing. 
That, well, that's what's really interesting. So like you said, a bunch of people think NASA invented this. I feel like NASA hasn't done their part to clear up this myth, but that's neither here nor there, Luke. It's like but what one is of those cool, things you kind of let happen. Yeah, I think so. But like you were saying, they had to like strap stuff down so that it wouldn't be floating away out in space. But there was like, like an almost anti-Velcro sentiment around the world. Like this is useless. This is stupid. Why would you mm -hmm. possibly use this stuff? But once it started going into space, and remember, this is when, when NASA and space travel was really all the rage. It's kind of like Blue Origin and SpaceX and stuff today, mm -hmm. when we were first going to the moon, first sending people into space, this became futuristic. This became like the cool thing to have. So applying it in other ways, even if it was kind of nonsensical, like shoes and stuff that you don't need it on, became the cool thing. And so it, it was actually hip to have versus, you know, unwanted. I'd say very hip. Wow. Okay, well, if you say very hip, then that's the case. Before we continue, may I take a break for a word from our sponsor? <laughs> it's got to be Velcro, right? It actually is not Velcro. Oh. We don't have a sponsor this week, which is very sad to me. But what we do have is better than a stinking oh, sponsor. They're shout outs. They're, 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 shout -outs. they're our peeps. That's right, our peeps. Peep number one, Who do Charlie, we got? Charlie R. Good old Sea Dog. Yeah, good, good old Sea Dog. And these are always one of my favorites the old correction email. Oh, no. <laughs> Boiling oil wasn't a thing in the Middle Ages. There was no place to buy barrels of oil. It would have taken a long time to render the number of animals needed to do any damage to an attacker and would deplete the livestock within the town. They would have used water. I didn't notice the promised full episode on armor. Could you please do that one? So I don't even remember the episode. <laughs> I, I think it was one of, remember we did basically the James wants to talk about Game and Game of Thrones series oh, of like castle right. building and stuff. Yeah, I think it was yeah. in there. I've already emailed Charlie back and blamed you for that misinformation, oh, but he is you. correct. Oil is more of like a TV and movie thing. They would use like hot water and hot sand and dump that on people because it was more readily available. And then I did put the armor topic back on our list i said you know we come up with these things during the episodes and by the time the episode is over we forget about them so yeah, totally thank forget. you for the reminder mr charlie uh shout out number two will k will says i'm a current senior in high school and i also attend the regional governor stem academy at my local community college I Sounds had to smart. Google what it is. It's very cool. It seems like they partner with like a local person to solve an actual engineering problem oh. in the community. Sounds very cool. Um, I just started listening to your podcast and wanted to let you know how much I enjoy it. I've only listened to about 10 episodes, but I'm always interested and entertained by the topics you choose to cover. This is my favorite part. I love telling my dad the awesome facts I learn from your podcast. Keep so doing what you're doing. That is what this podcast is for. It's for impressing other people by knowing very, very little about one specific topic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is it. Well, that's exactly it. I was kind of afraid that I'm like, oh, are these the fun facts that, you know, we just kind of make up or are these actually facts that exist? So thank you, Will, for writing in. If any of you would like to tell us how your, the fun facts have made your life better, impressed your friends or alienated you from other people, if you want to, I don't know, just say hello, suggest some topics, or as always, point out things that we got wrong, please feel free to email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and review. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. That's right. So Luke, we were back talking about NASA and how they stole the idea of Velcro from Velcro. No, I don't think that's where- Is that not how it went? I'm fairly certain that's not that's what happened. That's why NASA never responds to my tweets. Oh, uh, ah. go figure. So what's next? Uh, so I'm just going to burn through the history really quick, Please if do. you're okay with that. So, um, so up until this point, the the it, it was nylon loops and nylon hooks that had to be individually cut. So, so ridiculous. And, and the manufacturing process was basically like people with scissors going like that. It wasn't, but it was really difficult. Um, right. In 1967, they moved to a molding process for the hooks where they actually used continuous injection molding to actually create 
uh, the actual hooks themselves. So the loops are still fabric nylon loops that are woven. But in most cases, if you look really close at the hooks, uh, they're actually molded plastic. Yeah. So, uh, and it starts to make its way, um, you know, into society. In 1969, it actually went to the moon. It was actually uh, a part of their spacesuit, I believe, uh, where the U.S. flag was attached. I believe it was Velcro. Uh, and then it starts like really taking off. They start opening up branches all over the United, all, United States, all over the world uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, then they start to get into like super heavy duty uh, applications. They get into military applications uh, in the 80s and 90s. They get into making super strong construction grade uh, Velcro that can hold like 30, 40 pounds. And we'll talk about the different types in a little bit. But the one that I want to make sure that we get to uh, is in. I can't believe it took all the way till 1996, but 1996 was the first time they had a wire tie. So, you know, the Velcro ties that like go around wires, like what were oh. they using it for before that? Like May maybe it wasn't as big of a deal because not as many people had computers and yeah. all of that and didn't care about the wire organization as much. Yeah, I don't maybe. know, but even like my television and stuff will come with those now. Mm -hmm. So you're right. That is surprising. Uh, and then uh, they, they start getting into like specializing. So they start getting into uh, medical products for like personal care. So think like diapers and, you know, those sorts of things uh, in the 2000s. And here's another one that like really, I, I was super surprised by. The first time they were pulled into blood pressure cuffs was in 2014. How did they well, put blood pressure they... cuffs on before 2014? That's a great question. 2014? No way. It, I'm reading it off of their website. It says Velcro companies began contracting manufacture of high pressure blood cuffs uh, in uh, Mexico to start manufacturing. I, I, I find that hard to believe that. So I... Maybe a misunderstanding. Um, I feel like I've, that's only seven years ago. I know. I, don't I had know. to have had a blood pressure G I mean, thing on there before it had that to had be. Velcro. Yeah, uh, I don't believe that one. So I'm going to fast forward all the way to, to 2020. They oh, finally decide to get eco-friendly and they start oh, making, they have a whole line of products that are made out of 65% recycled material uh, or more. Uh, and they actually introduced a whole line in 2021, this year, uh, a whole brand of eco products specifically for the footwear, footwear and apparel markets. So huh. quick so history. So they like biodegradable. I think, I think you see a lot of recycled. I think plastic. it's, I think it's recycled plastic. And you see a lot of companies nowadays, like talking about the fact that their materials are recycled and then you put in Velcro that wasn't. So I think they're like, these companies were asking them to make eco-friendly products so that they could say their products were in uh, that, turn eco-friendly. That makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, can I back up and do a couple fun facts you kind of in the history? Anything you want. Okay. So first you were talking about how they had to go in there with scissors and snip them one at a time. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not wrong, right? They had to do that. But then our, our inventor here, Georgie, he actually came up with a pair of scissors that were similar to like barbershop scissors mm -hmm. that kind of cut at an angle. And so even though the process still was terrible, uh, this at least sped things up because you could chop a whole bunch of these loops into the hooks very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you talked about how you would put them under the infrared lamp and whatnot to keep that shape and keep them stiff. Uh, but a couple other fun facts, we already talked about NASA, but this is just kind of to help people understand just how crazy these things are. Fun fact, there are literally hundreds of thousands of hooks and loops on a single strip of Velcro. So you look at it and it's just that like jangle of like the fuzzy mm -hmm. stuff and then the, the hard stuff. There's hundreds of thousands of hooks and loops in there. And so when you smash them together, not all of them catch, but they don't have so to. many that they yep. don't have to, right? And then you pull them apart. But what I didn't know, and it makes sense, but I always thought I just did this because it felt right. The more pressure that's applied to the nylon, the more firmly the hooks are going to catch onto the loops. And so when sections of Velcro are held under tension, such as like in a shoe or a sneaker, mm -hmm. uh, the, the strips are pulled through and the bond then remains strong. So every time I go and I like smash it together really hard, it actually is making that connection stronger. 
I always thought I was just kind of being stupid. So that was all I had to say about that. All righty, good. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned it, so we'll do this before uh, our okay. next break, but a little Velcro 101. So you were talking about the strength of Velcro. So there mm -hmm. are three different ways they measure the strength of Velcro. Who knew? Who knew? And so first of all, it all depends on like lots of factors. So it's it, it surface area, obviously. Um, one of the most, one of the one, I never remember seeing this live. You were probably too young, but David probably. Letterman put on oh. a Velcro suit jumped off like onto like a little trampoline thing and stuck to a wall wearing a velcro suit i um, watched a video of it for this i don't remember seeing it live but yeah i remember seeing that and, and that's a perfect example of surface area he was completely covered in the material but if he would have just like jumped and just like had like you know on his hands he obviously wouldn't have held so a lot sure. of its surface area uh, but there's three ways they measure it. The first one is what they call the peel. So if you have two pieces of Velcro that are stuck together and you pull them 180 degrees from one another, uh, from one end to another, this is actually the easiest way to disengage Velcro because you're taking uh, a very small number at one time. So right where you're separating them, that's where you're, you're, you're separating them. So it's the easiest way to disengage Velcro. Have you ever tried to do it any other way? Well, it was so, interestingly, so there is also a shear when it comes to Velcro. So you take those same two pieces of Velcro, you put them together, and this time you pull them in the same planes opposing one another, and you well, pull them that? apart. Um, in the same plane. It's, it's the way they measure it. I guess it, you can tell how much weight it could hold. Then exactly. Something. So okay. like, so if you okay. imagine it's on a wall and it comes straight down. So like the Velcro hooks on a wall. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the command strips they're called. Um, I have some right there. Yeah. So the, the, the pictures behind me are Velcro command oh, strips. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that would be a sheer example. And then the last one is tension. So this would be if you would mount it on a ceiling, let's say, it's those same two it's together like it and it's pulling apart. it apart. That is actually the hardest to do if you're, pu if you're pulling equally because- That makes it, sense. All of the loops have to disengage at the exact same time, where if you're peeling, it's just that right where the peel is happening, it's a lot easier to peel apart. So. I kind of feel like I want to do that now where <laughs> I just like try it each way where it's like super easy, kind of tough. And then just like, I can't even do it. And I feel bad mm -hmm. about myself. How interesting. You never knew that, did you, James? I, I did not know that. But what I do know is it's time for this week's Luke's Rant. Okay. So uh, this is this is serious, James. Uh-oh. I don't this like is that. serious business. Uh, okay. So I'm an enormous sci-fi fan. You are. Dune was uh -oh. one of my favorite movies from the 80s. Uh -oh. uh, they're, they just remade it with good friend of the show, uh, Peter Chalamet, um, and the guy, the Kingfish guy. Um, the Kingfish, Aquaman. Aquaman, uh, Jason Mimosa, friend of the show. Yes. Long, and long it's listener. like, I have to just pretty much stay off of YouTube until I go watch it because like, I what does the ending mean? What do, yeah, I heard it's amazing. And like, I don't mind watching a trailer, like I'll watch trailers, but when you do those, what does the ending mean? And all these other things, and we're already talking about a Dune 2, like, let me see the movie. So if you're out there spoiling a movie this big and this good for other people, um, you should be ejected from social media. What is the proper amount of time that you should be waiting until you're out there with spoilers? Until I watch it. <laughs> Everybody follow the unprofessional engineering yeah. Twitter handle and no, Luke will let you know no, no, whenever no, no, he's no, watched no, a movie. No, okay. I, I feel like you got to give it at least two weeks. Like literally, That's I think it, I think it came out last Friday in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube is the worst. Just like you they have all metaverse. Oh yeah. Whatever it's called now. It's just, it's so frustrating. Um, because like, I just have to like, you know, hide, hide, hide. So yeah. So don't I'm spoil sorry. stuff, people. I won't tell you about it then. I like that. <sighs> Did you see Can it? I... No, I didn't. Oh. Can I give you a quick rant? Please. This is about people on the LinkedIn's who you don't talk to for like five years. And then Alrighty. they're like, 
Hey, I think your work connection could help me out with what I need right now. How are you doing? Hey, could you talk to people to help me? Like, oh yeah, that's oh, just what no. I'm going to do. Or go screw yourself. How about that? Oh, James. That's That was all my rant. Sorry. But anyways, stop spoiling movies for Luke people. Yes. Gosh. Stop spoiling movies for me. All right. Uh, all righty. So I got two more sections. I want to two talk more. about uh, actually the manufacturing process and biomimicry. Which one would you like to go to first, James? Uh, do the manufacturing process. I have some stuff on that, so I'll actually be able to contribute very little. Okay, good. Um, so how's it made? So How is it made? It, it starts out with a whole bunch of bobbins. And if, if you don't know a what mommy a mommy bobbin and a daddy bobbin love each other no, very much. No, no, no. Like literally like the video <laughs> I saw of how they do this, there's literally hundreds of bobbins and these are just basically spools of nylon fabric. Uh, and this is for the loop version of it and for what they call the webbing. So this is the, the material that holds the hooks and hold the loops. Uh, yep. So a whole bunch of uh, individual strands and could you imagine if like you just went in and like moved them like they go through these little eyelets they they so they, they take these individual strands they cover them in glue and then they heat them up to dry the glue and they're still individual at this point um then they weave them into that that base fabric that you see so like when you think when you look at um velcro there's like a a base and then the loops kind of come up through the base um so once they're done with creating the base they actually um put the loops in the one side uh then they add the firmer or the hooks into the fabric uh from the other side so you end up with the two different pieces of velcro forgot what we were talking about <laughs> i was oh, wondering was i was like maybe that's uh, not the word he's going and for. they gotta dye these things and have you ever thought okay. about like you can't just dye nylon i mean this is this is like a plastic type material nylon. so yeah so just the dyeing process is super specific they put them in these giant containers and they heat mm -hmm. them up and they pressurize them they add the liquid it takes hours for it to penetrate into the fabric to get like red and blue and all the crazy Guess colors i've never thought about it yeah yeah it's yeah it's not like dyeing cotton i mean this this right. isn't it isn't a cotton fabric. Um, then once that's done, um, they take the uh, the hook and loop sides and they uh, slice them into the appropriate lengths and then the appropriate widths. Um, and that's essentially, in a nutshell, I don't know if you have more detail, um, how they actually manufacture. And it's a pretty impressive, it's a huge long assembly line that you see. Yeah, no, I, I think you got it. Um... I went back to 1979 oh, when the needle me. loom took over a more mm -hmm. modern and efficient piece of thing. It replaced the shuttle loom that they were using previously. And they would use like the needle punching to just like keep making exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yours is definitely the more modern process. I didn't have the part about, about uh, the dyeing process. It's never even crossed my mind, but that's interesting. Um, the hook and loop fasteners, the Velcro ones, because there are other hook and loop fasteners out there now, right? Now that their patent has run mm -hmm. out or whatever it is. Um, they're pre-coated in the factory with special adhesives as well. Um, all just general purpose for around the home. So they have to be safe for us to consume, right? Because you don't want to get poisoned eating these things when you're a child or me. Uh, most are latex free. And so they're all ready to use the peel and stick adhesive varieties, which you love so much, it sounds like, are made from like a high and low temperate for high and low for indoor and outdoor use, which is mm -hmm. very convenient. Um, and there's actually a, a Velcro brand heat and solvent activated adhesive uh, that can be used for commercial purposes as well. So really branching out there, not just for Reeboks any longer. Exactly. So uh <laughs> I have a question for you. It's kind of like uh -oh. a test. So oh, goodness. If you and it's, if you were going to buy an industrial version of Velcro webbing, so this is both sides. Okay. That was one inch wide by 75 feet. One inch wide, 75 feet. So you could actually cut it in the sections you need. Okay. okay. And, and this is the industrial grade version of this. What would you expect Super a strong. box of that to cost? Two thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! You had to know this. Yeah. Two thousand one hundred and seventy-nine dollars for a box of this, and uh, so this thing can go negative forty to 
800 yeah. <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, this so is the, like the space travel. One, yeah, I this guess. is like the industrial grade stuff. Oh, so uh, the average peel is 0.4 PIW. I don't know what that accurate, what's PIW? I'm not sure. It, it must be the angle. Uh, the yeah. average shear is 15 pounds per square inch. So that's the wow. shear this way. Yeah. Uh, and then the tension uh, is four uh, PS, which would be, I don't know. I would think that would be PSI, but it's not. It's PS. I, don't, I, I should know what that is regardless pounds sheer i don't know yeah okay well that's interesting no i did not know that number but i'm really happy that i yeah. got that close and last, i underbid so yeah the late. last thing i got james is okay what's called biomimicry do you know what biomimicry which is super is? cool i do know what biomimicry it. is because of this so I, I don't have it in front of me oh. but it's basically when we take something from nature and we try and replicate it for purposes by manufacturing it so ed Plus, or Ed, George. George. Little did he know that whenever that cockleburr was sticking cockleburr. to his, his legs and his dog's fur, that when he <laughs> looked at that under the microscope and decided to make something to mimic that, that he was actually doing biomimicry back then. He did not know because he was dumb, unlike us. So very specifically, <laughs> biomimicry is the practice that learns, uh, forms, and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges. I like that's what I said. Kind of. Mine was a little bit more eloquent. Yeah. Uh, one of the other, probably the most famous biomimicry. I don't know if you, what's the most famous biomimicry, James, that, that is out there today right now? I other than know. Velcro. I mean, Velcro sounds like it, but what else? I hope it involves cockleburrs. Nope. The Kingfisher's beak. So there's a bird called the Kingfisher. I know him well. And it goes into the water really fast to get fish, and it doesn't make a splash. And do you know what they used it for? Whenever the high-speed trains in Japan were coming out of the tunnels, there would be this amazing sonic boom that would take place because of the air pressure uh, as it exited and entered the tunnels. That's and up. they actually saw these birds diving. The fish didn't even know the bird was coming because it made no splash, no nothing. And they actually designed the points of high speed trains to look like the beak of a kingfisher bird. And it completely eliminated that like sonic boom, that noise entering and exiting uh, the tunnels. And it's more efficient and aerodynamic. Wow. I'm impressed, Luke. That is huh? something. They could have probably just tied a kingfisher to the front of the train but then it would have hurt the animal and you don't want that. <laughs> they could have held it to the train with a piece of Velcro. With a Velcro. It all comes full circle. It comes full circle, James. <laughs> what a way to end the episode That's there. nice. Can I do some fun facts? Let's hear them. At one point, Lexus came up with a joke video uh, making a seat out of Velcro where you would then wear a matching suit with the other side of the Velcro on the like the butt and the back okay. of the suit because it would help you stay locked into your seat at the super high speeds that, that your sounds, Lexus that travels Interesting. At. I like it. Another fun fact, a few years ago, the US Army retired Velcro from active duty uh, due to the fact that it was too noisy and it was also impaired by sandy conditions. So that's interesting. Uh, I know you mentioned that NASA uses um, Velcro, but fun fact, a couple of them here, NASA space shuttles contain 10,000 inches of special Velcro made of Teflon loops, polyester hooks, and glass backing. But okay. an even more fun fact about NASA is that there's actually a small patch of Velcro on the inside of their helmets in case the uh, astronaut's nose gets itchy. Think about that. So they like, that's turn a good their use. head and they like... Yeah, and they can scratch their nose on it. Interesting. Yeah, um, and then one more <laughs> Where for do you. you. Find this stuff. I know two more for you actually. Um, one, the first ever heart surgery, they used Velcro to hold the heart together. I assume it wasn't what held it together finally, but I think during the surgery it was used I to help not. hold it together. And then last but not least, when our friend George died in 1990, it only took nine years when he was then admitted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. That's that seems like a long time for a guy that invented Velcro. Well, maybe they maybe they have like that waiting period, like after football, after you retire. Yeah, you before you get years. the golden jacket. 
the golden jacket. That's right. Well, Luke, I think you made that episode a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Oh, thanks, James. Well done. I'm impressed with your biomimicry, your kingfishers, your trains, all of that stuff. Really impressive. Hopefully everybody else learned lots about Velcro and other such fun things like cockleburs. Um, again, if you do have any questions about Velcro, our research, research want to tell us about anything we got wrong or anything of the sort, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.